Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and for today's episode we have one of my favorites, knowledge sharing through writing. Luca Rossi comes on to talk about his process, his experience, his advice, and his challenges. Very open, very honest, and very inspirational. I'm going to put all his socials in the description below, check him out, as well as his newsletter, refactoring.club. And with that being said, thank you for listening. I'll see you on the next one. <laughs> I just messed up the end. Enjoy the episode. <laughs> I really look forward to a time where I have a I have a more flexible schedule. I feel like my my, my schedule is really flexible as is, but yeah, I do have like a normal kind of work rhythm, and it's not like a nine to five. Yeah. Sometimes it's an eight four, sometimes it's a ten whatever. Or sometimes I do work in the evening, but most of the yeah. time, like it's pretty straightforward. Like I have a few asynchronous calls here and there, and then we work together as a team. So I want to be working when my team's working as well. But I feel like yeah. if you're your own boss or if you're in a team by yourself, like that becomes more yeah. flexible. And then rhythm and routine and habits all of a sudden are going to be kind of your guideline in, in how much work you put out. And it's much more yeah, work ethic. It's true. It's true. It's true because this flexibility, I feel that uh, it is both a blessing and a curse. And yeah. this is something that I didn't really understand at the beginning. You know, I, I thought this would be. 80% a blessing, right? In, while instead it's more 50-50 the way I think about it because the fact that you don't have a team around you, you don't have, you know, a train of work that goes on even without you that carries you forward anyway, mm -hmm. uh, m creates more friction, you know, between you and doing actual work because, yeah. you know, it, it, if you do not do any work, there is nobody else that, you know, acknowledges that, that keeps you accountable for that. So it's like you have to spend more energy to do any work yeah. because it's just you by yourself. While instead, if you go at the office, you know, there will be th those days where you feel very low energy. But anyway, when you get into the team and to the flow of meetings and other things going on, you catch up, you know, with the with the train of things happening and you get work done anyway. Well, it's much harder when you're by yourself yeah yeah i can imagine that do you do you feel like that accountability is like you and your own because for the listeners listening in like luca has like 25k plus subscribers for his <laughs> newsletter like i would imagine <laughs> that you feel kind of a, a certain amount of accountability to those people reading your stuff as well sure uh, sure but you know there are um i try to i kind of think about my work as divided into the basics yeah that, that, that are like the most important things that i have to get done to uh to get the newsletter going like writing the weekly article uh doing the basic research etc and then there is all the rest of the work that is about you know maybe replying to people in the community replying to tons of emails go, m going forward with the product that includes other things etc and all these accessory things are things that i could theoretically not do any mm. given day without paying too many consequences you know yeah uh, so these things require more mental energy to stay focused and and, and say okay let's do them every day you have to do those etc with this as opposed to the actual writing of the newsletter which i'm very focused on and i know i have to do every day and no problem with that yeah it makes a lot of sense interesting before we dive deeper into the newsletter, like I, I'm really curious how that newsletter got to be. Like, could you walk us through how it kind of got started? Because you mentioned earlier that it started as a side gig initially. Yes. Why, why'd you start the newsletter in the first place? Yeah, it started uh, in 2020, uh, actually during the uh, the whole lock, first lockdown phase, at least yeah. uh, how we lived here in Italy. Uh, we we really couldn't leave home, couldn't do many things. And also since my startup was in the travel space, so much of our activities pretty much stopped together with travel in the, in the country. Uh, and so uh, I had uh, instantly more time to do uh, other things as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And I started reflecting uh, on, on my journey, on things that I had learned as a CTO uh, at my startup for about 10 years. And so starting to write more, write down more thoughts that I, that I used to. And I was already a big reader of all the newsletters. So I, I did most of my reading, reading through newsletters anyway. So I thought it could be a nice idea to publish uh, to, to get some of these thoughts out in public and get feedback from people and start some nice conversations. So th this yeah. was really the main motivation, you know, to get more exchange even with people. Uh, 
And then late that year in September, after I had lined up something like three or four articles in draft, uh, I started doing that f- at first bi-weekly and then, and then weekly. Uh, yeah. writing about things that I had learned over over the years as a CTO of a small to mid-sized startup. Uh, and then it grew very fast and, and I, you know, above my, my own expectations. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, totally. I'm really happy. That's about really it. cool. Man. That's really cool. I like that. So it's the same. It's similar for me doing the podcast that I already had been listening to a lot of podcasts and I could see myself doing this. And then when there yeah. was an opportunity, like I jumped on it. And for you with writing, like if you already follow those newsletters and you enjoy reading them and you have your own thoughts and you don't really see them represented in there somewhere, then I can see that yeah. inkling growing stronger and stronger until opportunity hits when you can jump on that as well. When it comes yeah, to tot- those newsletters that you were following, who was like a real big inspiration for you back in the day or even still? I can tell you that I was already uh, paying for some of them, uh, even mm. though, you know, back in 2020, it was still a very unusual thing to be paying yeah. for newsletters because Substack was just, uh, had started, uh, I think maybe one year before, n- not more than that. And yeah. I was paying especially for two newsletters. One is, uh, one was Super Organizers by Dan Shipper, which, which now got bundled into the every uh, collective of newsletters. Um, which talked about productivity with interviews uh, from some of the most productive people in the world and was very, very inspiring um, for an organization geek like me. Uh, And uh, and another one was Lenny's newsletter, definitely. uh, That is still a huge source of inspiration. And it's still, it's about product management. I mean, for those who don't know, it is probably the most popular newsletter uh, in, in the business space uh, in Substack and I maybe in the world, I don't know, one of the most for sure. Uh, yeah. And it was a huge inspiration directly for, for starting my own because I thought about product manager as product management as a very close space to what I mm-hmm. was going to write about. So I took a lot of inspiration about the format, about the, the style. Uh, I love what Lenny does and uh, I told him many times, I mean, huge inspiration for starting my work. That's really cool. That's really cool. What I was wondering is because at some point you decided to start this newsletter, right? And at some yes. point it also hit critical mass where you were like, all right, I'm going to do this full time. Can you walk me yeah. through kind of your train of thought when that happened and what were those decisions in there? Like what was kind of a few fears that you yeah. had doing this full time? It was kind of a uh, combination of things coming together. Um, one was, as you mentioned, for sure, getting some critical mass. I, I think it was around 10,000 subscribers that I wow. uh, decided to uh, leave my job and doing doing this full time and launching the paid tier of the newsletter. Mm. Uh, but honestly, it wasn't just that because um, if it was for critical mass, I think I could have launched the paid tier uh, even earlier, you know, when I was like at four or 5,000 subscribers. Uh, it isn't much about the number of subscribers you uh, you, you have. Yeah. Um, it, because anyway, it, it is more about the maturity of your, I think, of your workflow, the confidence you have that you can keep this going week after week and the fact that you are confident that the quality of your material will drive people to pay for it. Yeah. Um, so this was both a combination of reaching this mass and also the fact that I had kind of completed a big bunch of relevant work in my past work. So I was more confident that I would leave because uh, it was the right time. Uh, I could hand off my work in a way that was uh, reasonable and comfortable for, for the rest of my team. Yeah. Uh, and I could do this full time and it all came up together quite nicely. And I was happy about that moment. It was I, hard I for imagine. me to think about. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really cool. But 10K is a bigger number than I expected. Like initially, I would have expected like a few K, maybe even yeah. five as a max. But 10K, yeah. how, how did people find you in the first place? Like, how do people find you in general? Yeah, you have to think that I started with very, very little network of my own. Yeah. So I didn't have a Twitter following. I had maybe like 150 Twitter followers that were mostly like dead accounts for many years before. Uh, and few people on LinkedIn. So yes, of course, maybe the first 100 followers were kind of, you know, network colleagues, friends, friends of friends. 
but then after that, uh, I didn't really have a network of my own. So yeah. for uh, as a first, I started to um, join and, and get involved in many communities where I thought I could find people who were interested in my writing. Uh, of course, without, you know, plugging directly my content all the time like a psychopath but <laughs> try, try, trying to be helpful first you know answering people directly providing value in in comments and and direct chat uh, and then possibly you know when when it made the most sense linking back to articles that i thought could be helpful for people who ask it something specific yeah uh, so trying to minimize you know getting banned uh, into, into these communities <laughs> uh, and th- but this was really helpful because aside from growth from the newsletter it also uh, helped me make many friends and many people who uh, with whom i did more things uh, you know over time yeah. um, and then word of mouth got bigger and bigger anyway so number of people who share the newsletter uh, i also started doing some paid ads especially on twitter yeah. uh, which worked very well so overall i would say it was combination of things so communities organic growth and paid ads about you know one third one third one third okay interesting i like that you interacting in the community right a lot of people just really have a goal of like broadcasting whatever they have but if you yeah. want to do it effectively, you want to add value, right? So finding the right people, asking the right questions, and then sure, you might have written about like the thing you think is valuable for them. That then is coincidence, right? Because if it's really of high quality, then it will bring yeah. them value. Yeah, totally. And I think it uh, it was also, you know, in retrospect, very important because it gave me the opportunity to build kind of a feedback loop about mm. my writing because audio, otherwise you don't have really many ways of figuring out if people like what you write yeah. uh, or whether, you know, they would like you to cover something else. Uh, so at the beginning, talking with many people in the community and also talking with people that were early uh, subscribers of the newsletters, I connected with them over LinkedIn. I mean, I reached out to them one one by one, yeah. uh, asking for feedback or, or other topics they would love to, to hear uh, about because there, there were about challenges at their work or something like that. It really helped me... Uh, figuring out what was working, what was not, especially because at the beginning I I wasn't, I hadn't very clear in my mind what had to be the scope of this newsletter. So yeah. it was pretty much a thing that uh, came into shape over time. Yeah. How did you, because a lot of people talk about finding your niche, right? A very specific yeah. subset that is also going to resonate with your audience, a topic or yeah. like at least a certain amount of focus in the content yeah. that you create. It's one of the yeah. many things that I've thought about in creating this podcast. And I'm, I'm very sure it was similar in creating your newsletter. Like, how did you yeah. find either your topic or topics or what is your thought on that? Yeah, uh, at the beginning, I really obsessed over this. Mm. Uh, I, I'm a guy who tends to plan uh, uh, pretty much things, you know, that, that I try to achieve, my projects, so to, to an extent that is probably too much, right? <laughs> so at the beginning, as an engineer, probably. Uh, so at the, at the beginning, I, I really thought about w- what are the things that I'm most knowledgeable about, where I could can write, bring the most value. Uh, but I think in the end, this was not very, you know, very useful as a train mm. of thoughts because um, you, as a, if you think at at a, at a newsletter or a podcast or whatever you know creator uh, activity as a regular you know business or startup thing, uh, you know that these activities have risks, right? And so you have to uh, defuse the biggest risks that you can f- that would make you fail about yeah. what you do. And I think the risk of uh, not finding your niche, you know, of or the risk of writing about something that is uninteresting to people is for most people uh, way, um, more, you know, less problematic than the risk of not being able to uh, show up every week and being able to write something uh, twice a week or once a week, but anyway, in a consistent way, because that's the most important thing for, for growing something that is based on content. So showing up and having something to say and writing about it uh, every week. So the advice I would give, you know, to myself and also to somebody who is starting something similar is just go with the topic or style of content, type of content 
that um, you are the most comfortable writing about and you can see yourself uh, writing or creating videos or anything like that uh, for the longest time uh, because you enjoy it, because uh, you know about it. But it's always a combination of these things. You know, if you write about something that you know about, but you despise, <laughs> it's, it, it will not work uh, or <laughs> in the long run. Uh, and the opposite uh, is true as well. Uh, but yeah. try to optimize for that rather than figuring out where your niche should live or should be. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that advice. I think early on, I also focused on kind of my vision of what I thought my audience would be. But since yeah. then, like it, it has evolved in so many ways and also my interests evolve. And the fact that like you need to be motivated to keep doing this. And if you put yourself in kind of a corner and don't allow yourself to get out, then yeah, it can be dreadful doing the next article, the next newsletter or the next podcast, right? Because you yes. put those shackles on yourself. Well, if you exactly. have creative freedom and you don't really care about like your niece or your audience and you just imagine that if you enjoy it, that your audience might as well. And if yeah. that is actually the case, that can be hit or miss. But still, you need to enjoy it first and foremost and only then can it all also translate to your audience, I feel like. Yes, because it's a long game. I mean, for, for this kind of activities to be successful, it usually takes, you know, years probably, yeah. you know, to get to meaningful returns that make for a business or, you know, a full-time job, if that is your, uh, your, your end goal. Uh, but then also for another reason, uh, and I think that um, we tend to think that people are there for the content itself 100%, but mm. actually one of the reasons why uh, the creative economy is, is so strong, even, you know, counterintuitively in, in many situations is that people also appreciate the connection with the person creating um, the content. So yeah. you're, uh, without even considering, let's say, the, the topics that you cover in, in Beyond Coding, I mean, people that will appreciate the way you think, you know, the way you interact with guests, uh, your style of presentation, your style of thinking. Uh, and so... With that in mind, even if you diverge a little bit from, let's say, your usual niche, whatever it is, uh, people will still be okay with that, you know, uh, within an extent, because they they like you, they have an, a connection with you. Uh, so it, it is more important to to stay personal, honest, true with yourself than to stay 100% coherent with any given niche. That's what yeah. I believe. Yeah, I, I believe so as well. Like I... I had a real vision of where I wanted this podcast to go. And this is going to be like episode 90 something. And still, I feel like I hold true to that vision. And I have like questioned it because I, I put up a poll recently, for example, on my YouTube where I was like, okay, I'm thinking of things to improve the quality of the show. And this is one of the options. It's some feedback I got from a random person on LinkedIn. They said shorter episodes might be better. Uh, if you edit them, it might be a bit more snappy. And I asked the question, like, should we edit the episodes, because I always said from the very beginning, I won't do any editing. I want it to be a natural, authentic conversation. But yeah, if I do get the feedback that editing might be better, I'm going to question that with my audience. And they were like, no, 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 we like it as it is. <laughs> like, that's not really. And they had other ideas, which I'm considering now, which is really cool that you can have a community of your own and a dialogue about the thing that you're creating and yeah. even feedback, the thing you touched upon earlier, some people are going to give you feedback and you're going to be like, hot, oh, that I'm going to take with me and I'm going to incorporate. And, yeah. other, and on the other end, you can get feedback and you can be like, well, this is just, this is not my vision. So this is not what we're going to do in this case. Yeah. And I think being able to tie the, the, the feedback that you receive to a vision is so important because yeah. otherwise, you know, just listening to feedback without that uh overarching vision in, in the first place uh, leads can lead you to, to you know to suboptimal places because you can never you know trust uh, feedback as it is you know for what it is because it's tricky you know you might have like a vo very vocal minority small minority of people that advocating for something you know but they're but they are a very small minority with respect to their to the the whole of your of your audience yeah. uh, but it feels to you like something that becomes super important because there are like these 10 people who ask you for that all the time <laughs> uh, and that's where and that's where you know, maybe they're right right or maybe they're wrong and that's yeah. where you have to 
compare that to your vision, if that is coherent with that, if that is where you want to go. Uh, in that uh, in that way, feedback becomes useful, but not if you take it as face value all the time without thinking about the the overarching strategy. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I've I've gotten feedback and I've incorporated that, and it it will always stick with me. Where someone said something, I'm like, huh, that's a great mm, point. Like yeah. from now on, we're going to change that. Have you had that as well in the feedback that you've gotten? Like, what is a piece of advice or feedback that has always stuck with you? There are many. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there are many uh, that I'm uh, that I receive. I mean, I can tell you the ones that I'm receiving the the most recently. Uh, yeah. That is uh, making the content available either in a, also in other formats mm. like video or audio or podcasts. Uh, and because I know, I understand this is a good feedback because. I know there are people who prefer to listen to things rather than reading things, yep. or there are more like video people rather than uh, newsletter people, but maybe just because of their routine, like they may watch videos over lunch while they don't have really a slot for reading newsletters. Yeah. Uh, so uh, some things may work better for them than others, uh, but I'm hesitant, right? Because uh, of some of the things we have discussed be before, for example, you said you were a big post podcast listener, so it came natural to you to start the podcast. Yeah. Uh, as I was a big newsletter reader, uh, I'm not a big podcast listener. So I listen to a few, but uh, I don't feel I have, you know, my taste mm -hmm. very educated about what makes a great podcast. Uh, so I'm kind of hesitant in, you know, doubling down in something I don't feel 100% prepared on. Yeah. Uh, similar when it comes to video, even if I watch more videos, so I could probably, you know, have my way around that. But uh, it's tricky. It's tricky. Sometimes you know that the feedback is good, but it's still not easy uh, for you to go in that direction. Yeah, I can imagine. If someone told me, like, you should do a, a newsletter, I'd be like, man, you haven't listened to any of the episodes because I, I don't read a lot. <laughs> like, that would never work out. <laughs> yeah, but if we look at the, the skills, because you've, you've been doing this writing then since 2020, what yes. are kind of the um, the skills that you've noticed you've gotten better at? Like obviously your writing is going to get better, but also yeah. probably the ideas that you have or the topics that you create. Or like what are some of the skills that you've really honed? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've learned is really what's behind writing because uh, uh, as long as you write every once in a while, maybe you write your notes, but it is not like a professional continuous thing. Mm. Uh, we tend to think about writing as something that just happens. Yeah. Uh, while instead, when you do this week over week and you write long form content every week and every day, really, uh, it's like you get more sensitive to what happens in your brain, what, what are the process, what are the things that you think about. And writing is really just clear thinking. Mm. Uh, it's being able to take some thoughts that you have that are maybe, you know, in disordered shape and being able to put them in a linear shape that is understandable by people, finding the relationship between ideas, etc. So that kind of structured thinking is what I think I've become the most, um, I've grown the most uh, yeah. over these two years. Uh, and also, since I know that anything that happens over a day or in a conversation with somebody may turn into some ideas for, for an article, I feel I've become even more sensitive to finding new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of my concerns at the beginning was that I would run out of content, yeah. run out of ideas because I would run out of my whole, my, my skills and knowledge that I could reasonably talked about, right? Uh, while instead the opposite happened. I mean, <laughs> I, I have more ideas now than when I started, but just because it's like ideas were all around me all the time, but I I was not that sensitive, you know, to, to, to figure out that this particular thing could be something that I could take and write an article about. Interesting. I, I love where you closed off that you said like the ideas were already there and you've yes. trained yourself or like with writing, the skills have developed in such a way that you see those more, right? You see the opportunities and the ideas all of a sudden come to life or they're more clear than ever to write about. Yes. And I think that's a really cool skill. Uh, do you Thank think you. <laughs> in, <laughs> do you think a lot of engineers would benefit from writing in a way for themselves as well or like as a form of knowledge sharing like you're doing? Definitely, definitely. I mean, 
this whole refactoring thing, I mean, this whole uh, activity of mine would have, be, would have been successful to me, even though it, uh, it was not successful as a business. Mm. Uh, because the, the, the way it um, fueled my personal growth uh, because I did more research, because I grew, you know, these skills that we talked about, uh, yeah. were, would have been invaluable uh, uh, on their own. On their own, and also, uh, even though you don't have an incredibly successful newsletter or something, I mean, your writing anyway attracts more people that are similar to you, and we likely get you to meet people that are interesting for your career, for your life. Uh, I love. The, the the quote but I, I don't remember the author but they said that uh, writing is like networking for introverts mm. uh, because you don't have to show up and reach out to people but it's other people that reach out to you so that it's like a dream yeah uh, so and that that is really that worked that that way for me so That's I encourage awesome. everyone to write a blog even if it's just you know three articles per year it's uh, it's worth it anyway yeah yeah, I can imagine. I, I mean, writing is like from a technical sense, writing makes a lot of sense as well, like next to a YouTube video. Because if we're talking about like actual software and creating a piece of software, yeah. showing how you did that or what you did exactly with code snippets and text around it with the context, I think that is one of the best ways to convey like what actually happened. And I think a YouTube video is a great format in and of its own for that as well. But yeah. different formats are there for different types of content, right? I think if it's really like storytelling, I like podcasts. That's why I listen to podcasts as well. So it also depends on like what you really want to write about. Like, do you have yes. in the writing that you do, do you really have like favorite topics that you really can't wait to write about? Or is it all like your favorite? Because for me, it's really hard choosing like favorite episodes or topics. It's a, it is the same for me. Um I love writing about topics that are more uh, that are broader, so that are mm. more about personal growth, organization, mental models. Uh, but they are kind of rare, you know. It when when you find something uh, that feels truly, you know, general and that you can apply to many different contexts, and uh, and and it's a valuable idea about maybe your your the way you you think about something. Uh, it is truly a gem. It is yeah. something that I'm really, really happy w w when it happens, but it happens rarely. Um, so I, I, I mean, the, to make you an example, it's like when you read Paul Graham essays, uh, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with them, it's, uh, it's, there are some ideas that you feel are timeless uh, mm -hmm. and you can feel that and you're incredibly proud of, of when you can achieve something like that. Uh, but anyway, the, the only angle that I try to follow for things that are that I write is to strive to write things that are that will stand the, the test of time, even if it's more technical writing or writing about management things, so mm. more niche. It should I sh I always try to write something that is advice that I, I wouldn't say timeless because of course all things change, but yeah. will stand to probably a year from now, two years from now rather than, you know, writing a tutorial about the latest uh, front-end framework. Uh, yeah. uh, there are many online, not interested in that, and, and we'll try to steer away. Interesting. I, I've i never been conscious about, like, the length of the content or the value of the content that you put out there. Maybe you would be more conscious in, in writing in a way as well, because it is true that when I Google something and I see a blog post of, like, a few years ago, that solves my problem. I'm like man, they already thought of that like a few years ago or this is the context that I was looking for, which is really cool. I, I don't know if it's the same for podcasts. So. Like it's a different, yeah. it's a different ball game, I feel like. But you know why? Because I, I think it's also because of the medium. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, one of the things that I, I find harder for audio and video is that they're harder to index and search yeah. you know, online. So uh, they become like kind of a black box where it's hard to, I mean, the, there will come products, you know, in the future that, of course, make this easier. But so far, it's still hard to search for, you know, specific bits within either a single podcast or a, a list of many podcasts. Yeah. Uh, while instead, you know, for articles and write written uh, form uh, documents, you have all the all the ways of the world to do that. Uh, that makes writing 
I think in a way superior when it comes to the the shelf life, let's say, of mm. the content, because yeah. you can find it over time. But maybe audio and video are more easily to consume on the spot, you know, because they require less of your work to just follow the the content. Yeah. So it's tra- I think it's a trade off in the end. I can imagine so. Yeah, I, I never thought about that. One of the things I was still wondering is like when you wrote and this thing was kind of a side hustle, like you had your let me call it your day-to-day job and this thing as a side hustle. And probably your day-to-day job was a lot of experience and inspiration for the things that you wrote about. But yes. then, and I ask this for people that go full-time content creation, because this is always a thought from my end. At some point you're like, okay, I'm going to do this full-time, but you let go of that day-to-day job, which also might've meant day-to-day inspiration. Like, yes. was that a concern? And if so, like, how have you accommodated for that? It is, it is probably the biggest concern that I have even right now to mm. turn into one of such, you know, ivory tower writers that are <laughs> yeah. up there. You don't want and to be write. that. Yeah, I, and I don't want to be, be that. I mean, one of those guys that write about things that they don't know anymore because they're just, you know, detached from work for, they've been so for f- such a long time, you know, yeah. uh, especially in a space that, that is tech where things change so fast. <laughs> where basically uh, if you stay away from work for like three or five or five years, I mean, nothing that you know yeah, is you still catch like up. that. Yeah, you got to catch up. So, uh, I mean, the way I'm, I'm dealing with this is uh, two ways. I mean, one is I, I try to allocate like 10% of my time to 20% of my time in doing some small consultancy to companies that uh, that I know, that I like, about nice. topics that are close to what I write about, yep. you know, to keep myself grounded, to stay close to uh, real world problems. Even though I know it's not, you know, the best use of my time when it comes to, you know, leverage, when mm. it comes to being coherent with making the newsletter grow but i think long term is uh is wise or at least i i hope it is yeah uh and the other thing is uh talking with as many people as possible who instead have a very practical hands-on experience about work yeah. uh interviewing people embedding in my articles experience from other people who i ask about you know uh, the newsletter has a community as well for example mm-hmm. and i anticipate there are the articles that i will write and people can uh, join, basically uh, answer with their own ideas, their own insights, and I quote the authors in the in the newsletter, yeah. so that I stay some somewhat close to the <laughs> to real world experience, uh, even though I, I cannot make uh, much of my own anymore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What I wonder is because for me, podcasting, like I've done two Q and A episodes actually nowadays. But that were two episodes out of 90 where it's just me and the camera and obviously I have questions which I answer from the audience. But I always have like a counterpart, always a, a person to bounce ideas off of or have a train of thought with. But for writing, I feel like, I don't know if you are always like kind of solo-ish or do you also have like that collaboration aspect with other writers or even like your audience in that way? This is also such a good question. Uh, I mean, you have lined up very good questions. I mean, the, the, the last ones <laughs> about so my, uh, they're, they're really, they're really the, my actual concerns that I'm thinking about right now. So uh, another thing that, I, that I'm worried is that uh, if I focus too much on my solo writing, I mean, as much of a you know, brilliant writer I might ever be, it will all, all, only be my single perspective about things. Yeah. You know, my, my perspective is limited, especially because many of the things uh, that I write about, like management, uh, themes and topics, don't have a one size fits all solution. So I, I might have seen something that worked in my case, but it might not work in somebody other case. And it's hard to synthesize some general rules that work for everybody. So yes, I try to involve other writers and in part, uh, this is what I'm trying to do, as, as I told you, with the community uh, in a small scale, in a way. So that there are many people who answer to the upcoming topic of the newsletter, telling them, or t- telling me what are they be- their best ideas about that, and I embed them. But I think mm. this is still a small scale because I'm still the curator of all of this. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm trying also to open up a little bit and write articles together with other leaders or bring... Uh, you know, skill, skilled leaders and writers that I know and trust to write about something specific that maybe I'm not much experienced about. So, so to turn the newsletter eventually into 
uh, something that uh, instead of being just myself writing is a collective of gifted writers that can each uh, bring their own piece of experience to that. I like that a lot. Like that diversifies the perspective and probably also challenge your thought process, which in the end makes yes. the content of, of higher quality and, and better, right? In, in a way, which I think is really interesting. Yes. One of the yes. final thoughts I had was more so about your writing process, because you already mentioned like, as you write more and more and more, like you become more apt at finding ideas and actualizing on those. But what is really your writing process? Like when you think of ideas, do you pick up a pen and, and like make a note or do you write a piece and like stash it away for later? Because if I would do that now, like even my notes that I take now have been a mess until like a few months ago <laughs> where I was like, okay, I need to organize this because this is a yeah. like an organism going out of control. What is going to be your writing uh, the, process? Th this is a great question. And I think uh, this is one of the most counterintuitive aspects, uh, at least judging from people I, I talked about, I talked about this uh, yeah. because um, it all starts with note taking. So yeah. uh, I take notes in a very structured way. So I, I save what I want to read for later. I highlight on re read later apps. These highlights go on my notion. So it's, uh, uh, it's all very careful when it comes to uh, taking notes and organizing my notes yeah. uh, so that I basically never have to stare at a blank page to yeah. write something. Uh, it always starts with something that I've already jotted down in the past uh, so much that at any given time, I have like 10 to 15 draft drafts of articles wow. that I may write, you know, yeah. because I, with each with, you know, some just some notes written down and maybe so may, most of them are not, ready you know to be picked up and and that i can follow up and write a full article about them uh, but any given week i can just go through them and pick the one that i feel is it is the most ready it has the 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 most num the highest number of highlights and ideas for myself you know and references from other articles that i can follow to create something that is original original is valuable and so on uh, so my advice also for writers is Never try to do like the the bulk of your work in like one sitting. Uh, this heroic uh, <laughs> task of sitting uh, in front of uh, the white page and then cre creation happens, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it doesn't happen. Yeah, inspiration. I mean, it, does, it, does, it shouldn't be that way. If you stare in a blank page, uh, something is wrong. You have to start with the note taking, with the uh, baby steps uh, yeah. all throughout the way. I, I love that you have, like, it sounds like your process is down to a T, like, honestly, where you, like, have tens of fifteens of drafts already ready with notes and things that you got inspired by, probably, like, yeah. just living your life or reading or writing about other stuff, which I think makes it a lot more sustainable at the end of the day, right? Because you've already touched on this. This is a yes. long game, like, for the longest, and making and optimizing your process the custom yes. fit for whatever you need. I think that's going to yes. be key in like the longevity, longevity of this thing. It's the it's long game, and I uh, totally agree about optimizing it for being sustainable for you. Uh, and anyway, for for the sake of clarity, when I said drafts ready, yeah. drafts for me it's like maybe five bullet points. Sure. Okay. So something like very very small. Uh, that I should then take and turn into an article at some point, mm. but only when I feel I have enough ideas and insights written down as bullet points in that way. So there, yeah. there have been times where maybe a draft has been sitting there for like six months. Okay. Uh, and then eventually, you know, after I read one more article or talked with one more guy that told me something more about that, I felt, okay, now maybe I can write an article about that. Uh, yeah. And I choose that for the week. I can imagine that. Yeah. For me with the with the podcast, like at some point you're like, okay, this is kind of my quality level. And as yes. you write more stuff or as you create more content, the quality level, you also want to increase that. Have you had yes. like an idea of the quality level that you want to have? And even so in releasing, have you at some point have been like, okay, I need to put out something and I know this is like either on the level or maybe even below or just above. But I really want yeah. to put that out for consistency's sake because I've absolutely had that. Quality, quality is one of the things that um, w when my mind is, the way I think about it, it, it has changed the most over time because mm. I, I'm I'm a perfectionist, you know, by nature. If I follow, you know, my own uh, 
feelings and desires i i would spend like uh forever to to write a single <laughs> piece yeah. uh, and while and any it, i did so at the beginning when i told you that i i lined up like three to four articles be, um, to have them ready before the start of the newsletter it, it took like four months to write to, uh, to write yeah. them uh but then i think that the 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 accountability of having to be consistent and publish a newsletter every week really cures that because you begin to accept that uh, it's there is not a, like a level of quality that is absolute, but it is more about uh, what you can produce in a week. Mm. Uh, that 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 is you know your level of quality, and you try to do baby steps to increase that over time. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to tell you like many do like. Uh, every article that you write, you have to think it's the best article you ever written. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. No, it's not <laughs> like that. I mean, let, let's be serious. I mean, th yeah. there are articles that you think like there will be some uh, among the best you've written and others that you think this is good, but this is the best I got this week. Yeah. Uh, you know, for my energy, uh, there are better weeks and worse weeks. But if you have the process down uh, and if you are, you know, if you trust uh, your workflow, you will never go below some quality anyway. Yeah. That 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 is what you should assure. That you know you you have stroke of inspiration that makes an article maybe three times better than another one. But uh, the workflow and the process is what makes uh, the the baseline level of quality that you never uh, go below. I love that, and I love the honesty. Honestly, when people say like this is the best one we've had. Uh, that is my hope, which each and every episode, obviously we strive to be and, and strive to be better and improve. But yeah, topics differ. It's a moment. Uh, that's, I was going to say something very Dutch, but it's a time in, in, I don't know how you say that in English even. Like it's a time and a place, <laughs> I guess. Uh, yes, momentum yes. for the Dutch listeners. <laughs> but in any case, it's a snapshot of time. That's That's the thing I was looking for. And that's going to yes. be different. The next time I'm going to have a similar conversation with some other person, like there's going to be similarities, but it will be very different. Even you and yes. I, if we would do this conversation in a week after, we might not hit all the points we hit and it would have a different flow and a different cadence in a way as well. Yes. And that also uh, makes the, it interesting, this all, I think. This all comes back to, to the fact that this is a long game. Yeah. So you have to optimize for your own uh, comfort, so for it to be sustainable. So there are times where you have to go easier on yourself because maybe you're more tired, maybe uh, you had a bad week for other reasons. And uh, when it comes to this, you know, uh, knowledge work, creative work, uh, it all affects your performance, let's say. I mean, yeah. if you slept badly or, you know, if you have concerns uh, that are related to your family or to your loved one or to other things, it all goes into the work, into your work. Uh, so uh, you have to learn about... Uh, when it is time to push more and when it is time to go to go easy with yourself and this is uh, this this has been very hard for me because when you are by yourself you're not surrounded by a team you have you haven't like a support net as yeah. you do when you are in a team it's different uh, yes it's different so and this is something that most people do not realize i think uh, from the outside uh, that it comes back to the thing that flexibility and being on yourself, it's both both a blessing and a curse, I think. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. But then having those conversations like you're having can probably be really energizing, right? And inspirational yes. where you talk about a person's context with the idea and the experience you've had for yourself. That yes. for me, like even with a podcast, that really gets me going, that really inspires me. Figuring totally. out like trains of thoughts and talking to, to people. Totally, a, a conversation like this one that we are having, you know, it is very energizing to me. You know, being able to speak openly, you know, uh, with somebody else uh, ab about this kind of work is really energizing. And I, in, you asked me before, what is something that I I became better at or mm. time with because of the newsletter? And one of these things is I think uh, speaking openly about the way I do things my concerns, the things I'm worried about, the things I'm proud of. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is also because I work mostly by myself. So mm -hmm. every situation where I can uh, speak deeply and openly with somebody is a great uh, occasion, you know, for exchange, for, for, for building uh, bonding and a building relationship. And so I, I'm more open to that than, me, than I was probably when I was in a larger company. Yeah, yeah I can imagine so. I, I've really loved this conversation so far, learning from 
how you got the loom setter started in the first place, the, the process that you have in place now, and just it's just been a joy like learning about how you share knowledge in, in a writing Thank form. Thank you so much. One of the final thoughts I had is like, what is the future for this newsletter? Like, do you have like a future vision for like a five to 10 years, even though I hate people asking those questions, <laughs> what's kind of the long-term game? Well, uh, to me, one of the, one of the counterintuitive realities of playing the long games is that uh, to play long games well, y- you don't have such plans so right. so long in time because you the I mean you don't have to fo- you don't focus anymore on games that you just enjoy you know winning but games that you have to enjoy playing as well because otherwise you uh, you don't get through these five to ten years that you, that you mentioned uh, but sometimes that also means that uh, you are enjo- you feel you are going to the right direction you enjoy doing that but you don't know exactly where this will will go and it's fine. You know, and when you are going in a direction that you are comfortable about, even though you don't know where what the destination will be, I think you are kind of in a in a good place anyway. Yeah. Uh, so transparently, I can tell you, I don't have like a final goal uh, with this. I think this is good for me right now because uh, of the way it affects my skills, my relationships. Uh, it is sustainable for me financially. Uh, so so far, so good. But anyway, I, I have some thoughts about the future, of course, yeah. uh, because uh, as I told you, I'm a guy that plans anyway. <laughs> uh, so I can tell you that I would like to involve more and more people in creating content in, with the factor. I mean, either uh, it's myself curating ideas and thoughts of others, or I have guest uh, authors and, and a panel of writers that contribute to the newsletter. Yeah. Uh, because one thing that probably comes to my you know founder uh, mindset is that i'm not thinking at this as a creator slash influencer you know gig where it's myself doing this i'm really thinking about this as a product yeah uh, so the fact that it's overly reliant on me it is uh, also a liability i agree way. yeah uh, so and i think it is something where many creators struggle uh, they are not able you know to detach over time from from the from their product uh whatever even like very big ones you know uh, that it stays something that is too closely related to their persona um while i like the fact that i'm building a product that is not like lucas newsletter i called it refactoring because uh, it is about something that is larger than myself i mean my hopes of course <laughs> uh, but, yeah but I, I, but that's the way i think it. about it that is that is really cool, man. I I really appreciate it. your honesty. Like you've been so open about your concerns and your challenges. I think is really valuable for the people that are listening in, and hopefully inspiring for people that love writing Hope blog so. posts or, or like to pick up. I I was gonna say pen, but like keyboard is more apt in this case. <laughs> Probably yes. There stuff. might be somebody who still creates newsletter by pen and paper, but yeah. mostly I think keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm gonna round it off. Luca, thank you so much for coming on. I'm gonna put all Luca's socials in the description below, as well as his newsletter, refactoring.club. Check out the website, subscribe, and thank you for listening. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you, Patrick, for having me. Thank you so much. No problem, man.